All right, everyone. Uh, we can go ahead and get started now. It is 1.05. Um, this is the third rendition of this year's Transportation Tuesday webinar series. Um, we're going to start off today with a welcome from our Executive Director, Leanne Redden. Hi, everybody. Uh, as Robert said, I'm Leanne Redden, the Executive Director of the RTA. Sorry, took me a moment to get off mute there. Um, but it is, it's my pleasure also to welcome you to, as Robert just said, the third Transportation Tuesday webinar. Uh, and this is really part of a four-part series that this year brings together RTA staff, regional and national leaders in transportation planning and economic development, uh, affordable housing, mobility, and throwing in a little bit of data analysis expertise. Uh, for us to discuss trends really relevant to the Chicago area in particular. And I'm, I think today's topic is going to be a really interesting session where we discuss and explore curb management. And I know a lot of people don't always tend to think about it unless they're inconvenienced at some point, but curb management is really a very complex issue. Um, and COVID-19 pandemic really sort of exacerbated or accelerated the rise in deliveries. Uh, and for all of us, I think, emphasize the importance of shared mobility and public transportation. So sort of forcing us to envision a new uh, future, if you will, for that very precious real estate, the curb space. So with that, I just wanted to take a few seconds to welcome you. And without any further ado, I will uh, turn it back over to Robert that can get the real conversation going. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Leanne. Um, like Leanne said, my name is Robert Morris. I'm a senior analyst here with the RTA. I'll be serving as the moderator for today's panel discussion. Uh, we are very excited to have four great panelists, uh, one from inside of our region and four from across the country, uh, or sorry, and three more from across the country. Um, today, uh, like Leanne said, our topic is curb management, uh, the future of the curb. Uh, this is an emerging space in the planning world and curb management plans and strategies have become increasingly more in demand. Um, that's how, as our built environment continues to shift in the COVID era. Curb space and curb management has always been a challenge. Um, and like Leanne said, the pandemic has only exacerbated the need um, for improved planning uh, for the curb as increased deliveries increase with uh, the competitive nature of other uses for our curbs. Um, curb space management seeks to inventory, optimize, allocate, and manage curb space to maximize mobility, safety, and access for a wide variety of curb demands. Um, the RTA is very excited to be partnering with the City of Chicago Department of Planning and Development for, to embark on our first curb space management plan, and that will be in the Kimball Brown Line Station area in the Albany Park neighborhood. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, share with you our agenda for today's webinar. Uh, first, we'll introduce our panelists. We'll go into presentations from each of them, uh, starting with Chrissy Mancini-Nichols, followed by Pierce and Mary Catherine uh, from Seattle, and finishing with Carmen um, from, like I said, DPD. Uh, we'll, we'll then transfer over into our panel discussion, and we'll save some time at the end for Q&A um, from our chat. So please feel free. Uh, to engage at any point with any questions that you have. Uh, we will have uh, Michael Horsting managing the and uh, managing and answering to some of those questions in the chat and we'll circle back and answer those and present those to our panelists as well. All right, I'll now introduce our panelists. If you guys could just go ahead and introduce yourself, um, starting with Chrissy, going to Pierce, Mary Catherine and finishing with Carmen. Hi everyone, I'm Chrissy Mancini Nichols. I'm Walker's National Director of Curb Management and New Mobility, working with cities across the country, large and small on these issues. And for seven years, I was with the Metropolitan Planning Council in Chicago and I lived in Chicago for about 12 years. So thanks to Robert and the RTA for having me back. I'm excited to be here today. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Pierce Cancer here. I go by he, he, him pronouns. I'm the parking and mobility hubs team lead at King County Metro. Um, my Chicago tie is I was born there on the south side. So uh, nice to be talking to folks from the hometown. Um, I um, previously worked at the, uh, in Minneapolis at Metro Transit there working on 
bus stop planning and layover planning and did some of some bus stop and layover planning uh, at King County Metro in a previous role um, and currently uh, focusing on mobility hubs, which is the sort of tie in, uh, of course, parking uh, with curb space today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mary Catherine Snyder um, with the curbside management team at the Seattle Department of Transportation and super happy to be here. Um, I also have a Chicago tie-in. I was actually just there for vacation um, two weeks ago. Um, so I got out of town before the super heat came in, <laughs> if you're still experiencing that. Um, so, uh, but love Chicago. I have a lot of family there and uh, happy to be here. And I am Carmen Martinez with the City of Chicago Department of Planning and Development. Uh, I concentrate primarily in the Northwest region. Uh, and uh, yeah, happy to be here. Nice to meet everyone. All right, thanks everyone. We'll go ahead and transition now into our first presentation from Chrissy Mancini Nichols. You can get to the next slide, Robert. Thanks. So we're all here today because we want to know how to get more out of our curbs. And pre-COVID, we were faced with growing demand from on the curb. Ride apps, commercial delivery, bike share, people spots. Um, then with the pandemic, we saw cities take this faxed action on something that has been extremely difficult to change over the years. These long held beliefs on parking policies that you just cannot move a private vehicle parking space to something else that has more value and, and more value for the community. But that's changed. So for example, um, we're working with this, the Downtown Development Authority in the city of Ann Arbor on a curb management plan. And a big part of that plan is slow streets and street shutdowns for outdoor dining. That's a huge priority for the city now. You know, people we're seeing people are okay with now moving that parking space around. So if it's one thing that the pandemic has reinforced, which we've all talked about already, it's that curb space is some of the most valuable real estate in the cities. Um, it's not a piece of concrete. It can be a community space, an economic space to encourage um, changes in how people and goods get around. Next slide. So Chicago's, uh, next slide, Robert, thank you. Chicago's experience with curb management. So going back to the original Chicago parking meter concession, you know, that's a real lesson for why we want to build a process for curb management um, and create flexibility to pilot and test. So, you know, we know the city um, of Chicago signed a concession agreement for its parking meter system in 2008. A year later, Uber hits the streets. No one could have foreseen that. In 2013, I learned this of the renegotiation of the parking meter concession agreement for the city. Um, that was 2013. A few years later, dockless electric scooters hit the street. You know, we also couldn't have foreseen that um, happening. The pandemic has fast tracked growth, growing trends in commercial delivery. You know, there's just been a lot of change overall to our transportation and curb systems that no one expected. So that's why it's important, as I said, to create flexibility in how you can test, pilot, and regulate your curbs because it's just constantly evolving. Next slide. And that means we no longer conduct parking studies only. You know, we conduct curb management studies. Even in the smallest towns where I work with 10,000 people, you know, we're seeing the need for more short-term parking spaces of 15 minutes or less. You know, we don't want people sitting at the curb for two hours or, you know, four hours or six hours or more. Uh, we definitely see the need loading commercial loading space in cities large and small. You know, it's a real fundamental change in how we're planning our streets at all levels. Next slide. But I highlight that thinking about how you manage your curbs um, is really about your local context and community needs. So, you know, what works in San Francisco may give you ideas, but you may not have the resources or the technology to implement block by block demand based pricing or reservation based loading zones. You know, you may need pri some private vehicle parking. You know, we like to say that curb management is a journey based on the needs of your community and your citywide goals. Next slide. Right now, I'm leading a research study working with six cities on curb management planning to understand usage. We're collecting tons of data. We're sorting through all the policy issues, the partnerships agreements, performing due diligence on all this new curb management technologies that's out there. We've um, vetted probably upwards of 40 or 50 products for their accuracy, for their ease of use. So I want to walk through some of the initial findings of the study. Next slide. 
Our first project, um, next slide please. Our first project was with the city of Sarasota and the city of Sarasota just received an award for their trolley and micromobility program. Um, so we were working with them to understand curve activity downtown so the city could plan for all these new uses. So we installed 16 cameras downtown and over a three week period, we collected 13.2 million data points. We really understood what was happening um, at the curb precisely in what areas. And some initial findings, you know, we found 30% of all the curb sessions had dwell times of less than 15 minutes. And there were very specific areas that had short stays. Um, and what's interesting is these short stays did not appear in the parking meter transaction data. That was really new information for the city. Um, we also found that in the areas regulated for no parking, and th these areas had zero curbs, uh, those were routinely violated on average about 40 times a day. That was all pick up and drop off. You know, we realized the need to create more dedicated space for passenger loading. And then on commercial loading, we found delivery trucks like UPS and Amazon um, that they were delivering to the streets that were regulated for no parking. Semis were using the alleys, but often they would block the travel lane. Um, and we found that there were peak times for commercial delivery, but you know, overall there was just a lot of commercial delivery across the day. You know, the peaks kind of ebbed and flowed. Next slide. We're now working with the city of Sacramento on a curb management plan, and we piloted passenger loading zones over a four week period. So we piloted these zones in a specific area near a hospital because this, the city had all this anecdotal evidence that there was all just a lot of pickup and drop off activity occurring at our pilot location. So we piloted for four weeks, we analyzed the data and there actually wasn't a lot of pickup and drop off activity at all that warranted a passenger zone in this area. People were still parking in the space, even though it was a colored curb for passenger loading. And you know that may seem like a negative finding, but it points to the importance of one, piloting these curb treatments before you make permanent changes. And then two, backing up all that anecdotal information you hear um, with data so that you can create criteria to um, have a process for how you change a curb use, especially in, for example, in Sacramento, when we're talking about moving paid spaces to unpaid spaces, or when you're moving about, thinking about moving paid parking spaces to um, paid passenger loading or paid commercial loading. Next slide. And not every city can use like fun cameras and data collection. So we did test manual collection with the city of Noblesville. You know, it's a, it's a smaller city, but there's a lot of activity downtown, but the activity is mostly focused on parking and some commercial delivery. So we found, you know, manual data collection, collecting like every 15 minutes um, with a clipboard. It's not impossible with enough staffing, but it's still challenging. And it would be very challenging in a larger area with lots of uses. But, you know, even in Noblesville, this, again, the short-term spaces that were regulated for 10 minutes, they were turning over constantly every three minutes. The longer-term spaces that were regulated for two hours just sat very full. Next slide. And happy to get into more of the study during Q&A, but one point I'd highlight is definitely the need for education and outreach with your community, with businesses, the need for robust staffing resources and clear processes. And what we're finding too is just having this data that you know you understand what is occurring at the curb every minute or even every second in some space. You know, we found across the cities because we've had more more robust data, we are seeing there's a lot more capacity than we realized, so that we can think about how we're planning for the peaks and how we're allocating the space for the different uses and when they need those uses. You know, we just didn't understand the full picture of curb activity when you're just collecting data every at 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3 p.m. on the hour because there's so much activity happening across the hour. So, you know, now we've amassed millions of data points by land use and are developing typologies that are resources then that we can apply across communities who may not have the ability to collect all this data. And last slide. Um, so next up, we're continuing our pilots. Right now, we're working on a coordinated commercial delivery zone um, program. And with delivery zones, there are so, just so many details, meeting with businesses, understanding their specific needs of the drivers, do they need room for semi trucks, smaller vehicles, need cargo bikes? Does the driver need access to the front door because they have to deliver kegs? You know, 
beer trucks and kegs um, are a big issue. So, you know, is there um, something that the driver has to deliver that requires a lot of boxes? Are deliveries planned at the local level or the national level with supply change? And, and how can you really influence those delivery times? Um, coordinating residential and commercial delivery, which has different needs. And then, you know, simply dealing with driver turnover. Uh, you know, we hear like Amazon has a lot of driver turnover. So how do you deal with the constant need to educate these drivers? And I'll just end with a story. We were recently meeting with some businesses about talking about, you know, is it possible to change delivery times or even implement delivery congestion fees? And, and one of the businesses said, I think, how we've done it is just the way we've always done it. No one has ever brought us together to coordinate. So, you know, just getting people in a room and talking about these issues can really open the door to some of these changes. So thanks again for having me and I'm happy to get into the details um, on the study and Q&A. Thanks so much, Chrissy. And there is her information um, as well on this last slide. So if you would like to send her a note um, or have a, another question offline for her, that's her contact info. Um, we'll now go ahead and start with our curbside management in Seattle presentation. Uh, Mary Catherine Snyder and Pierce Cantor. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, Pierce, did you want to give, sorry, did you want to give an overview or do you want me to go? I get started. Go for it. Um, well, so this is Mary Catherine Snyder, again, with the City of Seattle Department of Transportation. Um, thanks again for, you know, incorporating um, kind of the uh, Pacific Northwest perspective uh, into this effort. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, so Pierce and I are going to tag team here. I'm going to do a little curbside management effort, and then Pierce is really going to talk a lot about how curb and transit um, kind of inter interact, um, at least here, um, quite a different ways. Um, I thought Chrissy did a great job in talking about overall curbside management and some of the those uh, exciting projects that they have going on. Um, in Seattle, we have, um, you know, similar programs to cities around the country. We have, a, um, um, but generally our work is about uh, sign management, payment technology, uh, curb permits and program development and management. And so we have a uh, paid parking program where we set our parking rates in Seattle on street based on data we collect on a regular basis. We also have, um, in addition to a lot of street cafes, we have um, a new load zone, which we installed as part of during COVID uh, last couple of years for uh, pick up drop off for food um, and related activities for a five minute. Um, we um, are working on quite a few efforts with respect to improving how our load zones work. Um, so in Seattle, uh, we actually designate various load zones at the curb um, based on kind of the city's assessment of what kind of load zone is needed. So this slide shows just some different um, sign images of load zones we have. Um, and so we're working, you know, always kind of trying to iterate on how do we improve the effectiveness of the zones? How do we add payment if that's appropriate? Um, and um, really also do curb design so that we're installing the load zones and the part of the curb that um, is easiest for the drivers to access. Um, and then one of our newer programs is um, curb electric vehicle charging. Um, both in residential areas in Seattle and potentially in commercial districts to um, really uh, enhance and connect uh, curb management and uh, climate programs to help support electric vehicle adoption. Next slide. Um, and one of the big efforts that we have is really to, um, you know, not so much talk about the parking needs, but the curb needs. Um, and this is along the lines of what Christy was talking about as well with, you know, how do we prioritize the critical access needs that businesses and residents have? Whether it's, um, you know, a whole bunch of things get delivered or picked up at businesses or at uh, apartment buildings. And a lot of that in a built out city like Seattle, like Chicago happens at the curb. And so not just package delivery and, you know, um, goods and services, uh, solid waste, like how does trash and recycling get picked up on a regular basis? Because you want trash picked up on a regular basis. 
Um, and then, you know, other things like building services, where how does the plumber get access to your building? Passenger pickup, drop off. This can also include, um, you know, uh, ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, or handic you know, disabled parking zones. And, um, and obviously, we've seen a huge increase in on demand delivery services, uh, food, and, you know, goods and services as well. Uh, next slide. Um, so just a little bit about uh, SDOT, um, if, you know, so our, we're in the transportation department, but we're actually in the transit and mobility division. And so this helps connect to the rest of our presentation, just in terms of our team works pretty, you know, works within a division that has transit planning and mobility planning. And so how do we connect up and continue to kind of work through uh, what curb issues occur that you know are helping to support transit and also facilitate you know um, transit lanes or other kinds of transit um, speed and reliability measures um, and similar for uh, car share, bike share, or other kinds of um, kind of new mobility or emerging technology needs. We're kind of all in the same division to help. Um, be able to uh, collaborate and work closely. Um, so those are the slides I have, and I think transitioning over to Pierce and take it away. Thank you, Mary Catherine. So um, I work for King County Metro again. Uh, King County Metro is the local, uh, primary local provider of, uh, a, of transit service here in the area. Um, and, uh, as such, we work very closely with our partners at the Seattle Department of Transportation, which I'll refer to from now on as SDOT. So, <laughs> uh, and so SDOT, uh, by having this really fantastic proactive approach and organizing their uh, uh, structure to uh, sort of align with overall city priorities and goals to advance the movement of people, through transit and other means, um, it allows us to easily partner with them uh, uh, being the transit agency and provider. Uh, and so a lot of our curbside priorities are pretty straightforward that you'd expect, but uh, often kind of people lose sight of at different times. Um, clearly we have bus stops and layovers. We have over 8,000 bus stops throughout King County we manage. Um, and a lot of those are in the city of Seattle. So to do that, we both on either end keep uh, databases that we keep up to date with um, really good information around how long those specific bus zones are um, in general locations around those and constantly collaborate to update uh, changes to where those bus stops are. As you can imagine, bus stops are a bit dynamic and fluid. In a city like Seattle, where you've seen billions of dollars of new real estate development in a relatively small area, over the past decade alone, um, that in itself prompts like constantly moving around bus stops. Um, also tied into that, however, as uh, different streets are uh, targeted for reconstruction and other means, we're constantly evaluating where we locate bus stops uh, relative to changing uh, land use patterns and other needs uh, within the limited space within the right of way and trying to do better ways of accommodating multimodal access to transit, as you can see in a, a project that was done uh, to install a protected bike lane on a busy transit corridor at the picture on the left. Additionally, um, we have a strong need for pickup and drop off zones, and that takes in many forms. Um, here at King County Metro, we believe mobility is a human right. And we are really positioning ourselves to become a mobility agency rather than a traditional transit agency. And as such, we've endeavored upon uh, numerous uh, feeder to fixed route sort of innovative mobility type services uh, that use app that are app based in nature. And um, they're kind of micro transit in some ways or uh, trying pilots with stuff where you have like an Uber or Lyft sort of vehicle take you to and from designated pickup and drop off zones, and, uh, busy transit nodes. Um, and so really thinking carefully about how we designate space for the interim uses is really also important for us as transit as well. So 
Uh, and also to our uh, another piece of this that often gets lost that we've been collaborating with us data on and some researchers at the University of Washington on involves urban freight mobility. Um, being able to clearly designate curb space, especially in busy downtown areas to get the UPS truck out of the way uh, helps keep our transit moving in on time. And so we also have an interest in that and that's why we are active partner in uh, working with researchers at uh, University of Washington's Urban Freight Lab and with um, our partners at SDOT on clearing out uh, those vehicles from the street where possible. Um, and the last sort of bucket of categories of trans, uh, curbside priorities for transit involve transit advantages. And so um, we have a pretty well built out network of um, bus lanes um, and other transit uh, advantages like queue jumps um, throughout the city of Seattle and throughout King County. But um, that's uh, something we're constantly uh, working carefully with uh, the city of Seattle on um, and making adjustments through dozens of spot improvement projects every year that we target and fund together um, to really help keep our buses moving and on time. Next slide, please. So there are a number of challenges that we face um, for transit on the curb. Uh, and these are probably gonna seem similar to, for you, but also slightly different based on our specific local context. Um, here in Seattle, we have incredibly limited spaces for uh, buses to end their route and layover downtown. And um, in fact, we've reached uh, an agreement with the city to reduce the number of on-street layover spaces as downtown continues to grow and thrive. And um, that just makes, it just becomes really challenging to figure out uh, some of the route planning dynamics for that in really uh, is something we're constantly monitoring. And uh, we're actually now trying to move into a place where we start developing some off-street layover options, but uh, doing so can be really difficult and still fit in neatly within the urban fabric of a walkable downtown environment. Um, multimodal integration is always a constant tug and pull. Uh, some of the previous photos you may have seen, some integrations where we have like bike facilities coexisting with busy transit stops. However, uh, our aspirations and plans only take you as far as your dollars are available. And as we know, um, we're always constantly struggling to stretch uh, every dollar we have to meet a lot of different competing needs uh, on these projects. And uh, sometimes the, uh, the better and safer options uh, cost a bit more. And uh, it really prompts further thought around how we set up our project budgets. Um, and then uh, we also have uh, issues with bus lanes, making sure folks are actually adhering to the signs and the paint. Um, and we actually finally got some permission at the state le legislature here in uh, Washington to uh, technically pilot with some enforcement of bus lanes and deployed that earlier this year. And that's going on at some busy locations throughout Seattle. Uh, hopefully we're gonna get an extension on that and uh, I know that's being contemplated at the legislature and uh, really automating the enforcement for that. And then um, one last thing that's a uniquely Seattle thing, I don't know if Chicago doesn't have this, uh, a decent size of our uh, buses within the city of Seattle actually run on overhead trolley power. So we have trolley buses and um, you just have to be very mindful that when we're rechannelizing streets, and adjusting lanes, that uh, we have another set of lanes in the sky <laughs> uh, and it, it can get really challenging. And so uh, different uh, uses like, for instance, say like uh, a bus island to separate the bike facility from the uh, bus passengers uh, involves moving out that curb line well, that also means you need to adjust that trolley wire up, up top and that gets complicated and expensive really fast. And with that, um, that is our presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Pierce and Mary Catherine. Their information again um, is up here on this last slide. We'll now move on to Carmen Martinez. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, again, I'm Carmen Martinez with the City of Chicago Department of Planning and Development. And for all those who don't know what that is, we do uh, <laughs> pretty much uh, a lot of project master planning, uh, city planning. Uh, we work through a lot of proposals and uh, try to push forward any planning efforts uh, that we uh, are working on. So this is one of them. Next. So uh, this project really uh, came, came forth it was from the community as well as from um, our aldermen and the 33rd Ward. This was uh, just something from you know experience that residents uh, were having in this area. Right, right, right. And in particular, right, right. it was um, just a way of trying to help increase the mobility and accessibility to the Kimball uh, mm -hmm. station. Um, so again, uh, with, you know, without having the North River Commission, um, you know, without without their effort and their support, you know, some of these planning efforts probably would have taken a little longer. So we really appreciate having their input. Um, this also is comes from the supporting an existing uh, TOD study that was done by CPA uh, called the Lawrence Avenue TOD study, which was done some years ago. Um, and CPD was actually selected by RTA to receive hundred thousand dollars a grant um, through the community planning program. Uh, and the purpose of this was to identify how we could enhance accessibility and connections to transit and just trying to improve the pedestrian realm around the Kimball station. Next slide. Uh, again, this is a very brief over overview of the Lawrence Avenue TOD. And again, this study was just trying to uh, support one of the efforts that, that the, this plan actually tried to focus on. Next. Uh, and this was also trying to work in conjunction with some of the efforts that CDAT had themselves with their planning for curb and street group improvement, which they're actually currently working on um, this moment. And trying to work with both departments and uh, both agencies, trying to make sure that these planning efforts, you know, there is communication and there's coordination between, um, you know, their continual schedule of work as well as this overall vision. Uh, and the Lawrence Avenue TOD study that we're really trying to focus on infrastructure improvements, some of the TOD opportunities, which would assist with density, location to transit corridors, and just also trying to advocate for opportunities for development around these sites. And for those that are familiar with the station, um, it is uh, definitely in dire need of some improvements, infrastructure improvements are needed just pedestrian access, mobility access, and it's a highly, highly used uh, transit station. And there are safety concerns, which is a high traffic intersection near the station. There's a lack of open space, uh, also lack of development space for TOD initiatives. So we're just really, really trying to get ahead of this and trying to see what opportunities we can create uh, with this mobility plan. Next. Um, and as this, as this project continues, there's going to be continual engagement strategies. You know, we discussed having you know, stakeholder meetings, walking tours, making sure that community organizations are involved, making sure we're taking advantage of any social media updates, working with the alderman's office as well, still working with the North River Commission and any, or any other planning organizations that we're working with as well. So there's a lot of other studies that are happening and definitely making sure that we're being collaborative and, communicating uh, with other um, agencies we're working with, such as CMAP. Um, they're, they're a great organization that we've been working with and collaborating with as well. So the goals for this management plan are trying to create a framework for improvements, recommending uh, implementation for short and long-term improvements, identifying curb strategies and determining pathways, and making sure that we're trying to improve like multimodal experience, whether that's for pedestrian safety, traffic calming, bus, bus priority, um, enhancing bus stops, and as you saw from the photos, just overall access to provide safe, safe and accessible routes to the station. Next. And here's my contact information for those that would like to reach out and just hear more about the project. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Carmen. Um, like Carmen said, we're, we're really excited to embark on the first project that the RTA has participated in that is a curb management plan. Um, so we were uh, very gracious of some of the other folks that we 
our uh, other panelists that have more experience um, and are experts in this field. And uh, we're, we're really excited to, um, you know, gain more experience ourselves here in the region. Uh, again, thank you so much uh, to our panelists for your presentations. We're now going to transition into our panel discussion. Um, we do have a list of questions uh, that we'd like to get through, uh, but we also encourage all of our attendees to submit any additional questions uh, through the chat box that we'll be monitoring throughout. Um, and so uh, I wanted to for, uh, now take an opportunity to just remind you guys that this is the third of our fourth uh, rendition of our Transportation Tuesday. And uh, the fourth one is coming up next, uh, next week, again on Tuesday. Uh, so if you have not registered for that, um, you can find the link to do so in the chat. All right, we can now go ahead and uh, transition to our Q&A, our panel discussion rather. Um, I'm gonna start by uh, posing this into the order that we did our presentations. Um, and if you guys don't really have something to add, then just go ahead and, and we'll keep moving uh, to our different panelists. But I wanna first ask, what are some of the planning challenges that have long been associated uh, with curb space and curb management. We'll go ahead and start with Chrissy. So um, the politics around curb space is probably one of the uh, biggest planning challenges we've had to deal with historically. Um, but now that we're starting to hear from businesses that you know they just don't need parking space, they need loading space, or they want outdoor dining, we're seeing this change. And I, I think people now can see it in real life. So they, it's not so scary. You know, we can just move people off to off street parking or, you know, create mobility hubs like Pierce was talking about. Um, but to do that, you know, talking about, you know, the playing challenges around how do you manage and enforce the curb? You know, that's, um, are you gonna cite people or do you wanna incentivize people through payment? Um, and, you know, we've had parking payment. I think it's been a challenge to charge for commercial delivery, you know, other than having the delivery drivers pay a meter. So we're working now on, um, and Mary Catherine talked about this, payment integration and how do you uh, just have automatic payment? Do you work, working with your parking payment provider, whoever that is, to allow for you know, automatic commercial delivery payment. What does that look like on the city's back end and front end and you know, creating a roadmap for that? I mean, it's gonna take a while to get there, but the, you know, the technology is moving. Um, I think I'd just add one thing, I mean, that was great. Um, that, you know, it's also an emerging, um, a field where, you know, every week there might not every week, but it seems like every week there's a new company that wants to do a new thing to deliver something that you didn't even know existed, um, but everybody wants now. Um, and so how do we, you know, um, that's probably an overstatement, but something like that, you know, so how do we, you know, it's, it's a um, field where we're, we're kind of managing a lot of new things that occur, but also have um, a lot of competing needs that have been there for a while, right? So how do we, you know, and we're, it's within a space that is relatively small and not getting any bigger. You know, we're not generally in the cities adding, we're not building new streets, we're not expanding the streets to create more right of way for uh, driving efforts. So how do, you know, how do we work within a constrained right of way? But that's what makes it fun. Um, something uh, from, I guess, the transit perspective that's long been a challenge that we have some imperfect solutions around involved. Um, identifying, so given the multitude of different in, uh, existing and emerging uses for curb space, how do we properly identify what section of the curb is being used for what? And um, again, keeping track of that information as it's so dynamic. And so uh, that's an ongoing and evolving challenge, uh, something that we do that's pretty uh, low tech, but seemingly effective in Seattle is that we paint our curbs at our bus zones to demarcate where they are um, and try to create some buffer space that becomes eventually like to become like a really onerous task to constantly go out and repaint that. And if you being Midwesterners, you have snow and ice covering that curb. <laughs> like for any given time of the year. So that's not necessarily like a feasible option for you, but um, signage can be complicated. And then at some point you get like four different signs with like different iterations of trying to really uh, maximize how you use the limited curb space to your 
to, uh, uh, that you have available. So um, I think there's a lot of room for growth in this area and really excited to see how we can continue to like better communicate to community users how the curb space is designated. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we will see now, like we, we have these historical um, challenges that have always been a, a, a challenge with curb management. Um, and we, we think we touched on in each presentation how the COVID pandemic has really changed our built environment and changed certain demands. Um, is there anything else that our panelists have to add? Like how has the COVID pandemic and the, changed, um, the changes in our built environment change the way that we use our curb space and change how we as practitioners uh, have to react and plan for that? Uh, I guess from, from our planning side of things, I think it's, it's really challenging to try to react to the needs of some of these businesses, um, you know, having restrictions on, uh, you know, people limit, having outdoor space for qualified or didn't qualify, you know, some of these streets that are limited on sidewalk um, width definitely were really challenging. Um, and then, you know, what was allowed? You know, what, per, you know, what permits do they have to take? Did they have to talk to the alderman? There was a lot of communication challenges, uh, especially because you know, they also couldn't meet in person um, and also trying to create an environment for you know, open dialogue when you may not know who the right person is to contact. Um, and if you're not able to come directly to, you know, City Hall, for example, to try to meet somebody, um, I think that part, that part was really challenging and just trying to make sure that we had resources available for them, as well as funding. You know, there's, there's definitely resources the city has for um, small entrepreneurial businesses, up and coming existing businesses, and having that waiting period of you may apply, you may, you may be asking for funding to get resources to improve your storefront, to be able to bring in outdoor seating. And we, you know, we're in the Midwestern area, so of course it's heating and cooling and all those things and how do you do it quickly? So I think definitely for us, it was a challenge on trying to quickly react to people's needs. Uh, but I think the city did a great job on trying to provide you know, accessibility and trying to make sure that we're supporting the local businesses and trying to keep in mind that we also have a pandemic to deal with. So it was a little bit of a challenge on that aspect, but being able to quickly have you know, virtual, virtual access, all of our community engagement also had to go virtual. Uh, which was a little bit of a challenge for some of uh, some of our businesses that really didn't have much technology or weren't weren't quick to get on it because um, there's so many different avenues that we have now. So a little bit of a learning curve, but um, I think people are much more prepared now. All right. Um, I'll go next to, um, let's talk a little bit about transit and accessing transit. Um, so how really does access of transit impact the way that we plan our curb space? I guess I'll take that one first. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it really comes down to priorities ultimately. And so, uh, similar to how a lot of roadway jurisdictions have guiding uh, documents that uh, kind of lay out how they prioritize different modes within the right-of-way, uh, I think similarly there should be a, a hierarchy of need for how curb space is allocated based upon its surrounding land use and also uh, sort of the uh, sort of focus of that roadway itself. And so um, I think that's honestly the best way to start a lot of these conversations. And not everything's going to be perfect as you kind of work out the details for uh, each scenario, but uh, really being mindful of like uh, making space available for transit <laughs> uh, is important. And so even though it sounds really simple for a lot of folks on this call, like acknowledging that like, uh, you know, transit advantages uh, often time take up space on the curb and being mindful of that as a potential use can really have a really meaningful impact.
any other panelists, anything to add there? All right, I'm gonna couple our next two questions into one. Um, so at first, how can we make our curbs more accessible for persons with disabilities? And um, combined with that, how can we use an overall equity lens uh, to improve our curbs? Uh, so providing um, access to people um, with physical disabilities, you know, that has come up a lot in planning for parklets, for example. And one thing that I like about parklets is you're moving furniture off of the sidewalks. So you're providing more room for people to travel on the sidewalk. Um, I think you know, pretty much in all of our community outreach, no matter the city, we're always hearing the need for more ADA spaces. And we're going to be piloting some um, on, more entry ADA spaces and you know, thinking about like on a block, how many ADA spaces do you need? That's going to be critically important. And then in terms of equity, I, I mean, I think Seattle, Chicago, we're um, all do a great, great job of this is figuring out, you know, how do you pr prioritize um, the curb in terms of mode share, but then equity? So, for example, we were working with the city of Boulder and the city had these goals for mode share, but their cur and in fact, we're pretty on track to achieve them, you know, with 30% of people riding the um, transit, but 70% of their curb was prioritized for parking. So we work to fix fix that and, and pr prioritize the curb modally. But then we said, well, that's not enough. We need to figure out how to prioritize the curb in terms of equity. So looking at where are the origin and destinations of people, we know where the curb hotspots are, but can people from all communities access those hotspots with low cost travel ways? Um, so we developed a strategy to reconfigure their parking pricing program in a very low cost way where they are updating um, pricing based on demand and performance, uh, but they're, and they're taking revenue from parking to pay for space for transit lanes, transit passes for employees downtown, bike lanes. Um, we create a mobility safety fines and all those additional fines go into the transit system. So, you know, it's both in terms of figuring out equity at the curb modally and how you allocate the space, but then how people have access is, is more important than ever. Um, this is Mary Catherine. I'll just add quickly that, um, you know, we have a, at, at SDOT, we have a transportation equity framework and pretty active transportation equity planning. And I think one of the things I like to also talk about is that, you know, it's not um, equitable or, is it equitable to provide like free parking? And does that meet our transportation goals otherwise? Or is it about how do we make sure we're providing equitable access to business district or to wherever people are going? And that, you know, there are a lot of ways to do that, whether, you know, transit system or other kinds of methods. And so it's to try and move the focus a little bit away from um, particularly like the free parking part, because that um, might not really be, um, was needed and might not also help meet your other transportation goals and particularly our climate goals. If we just started providing free parking everywhere, we're really not meeting our climate goals. So how do we connect all those in a broader conversation? So. Awesome, thank you guys. And I just wanted to give a brief definition of parklet. So a parklet is when uh, you take, you transform a parking space into a public space. Um, that can be like, you know, if you install some grass or plants or amenities like that, seating. Um, but also um, sometimes this is like a business or an outdoor cafe taking that parking space, transforming that into outdoor dining. Um, there's, there's really many different variations, um, but that's something that has been increasingly more popular. Um, even before COVID, uh, I think it started with parking day uh, in San Francisco, maybe a decade or so um, ago and the COVID pandemic really help speed up and, and make those more popular. Um, I'll, let's talk a little bit about micromobility, um, e-scooters, and um, how that those have changed the landscape, how we integrate those into our curb space planning, um, and how we can try and minimize, um, I guess, uh, vehicular pedestrian conflict when it comes to uh, micromobility. Um, so something we've been doing, um, 
highlighted this in some areas where, particularly where we knew that there were going to be, uh, uh, you know, larger concentrations of like micro mobility devices, um, shared micro mobility devices, especially uh, at busy or bus stops. We've gotten uh, better at working with our uh, jurisdictions and event, uh, these micro mobility providers to like geofence areas where you can and cannot park those devices um, to try to keep clear of the areas where we're going to have boarding take place. And we've seen some relative success with that at some of these busier locations. Um, and so in addition to that, I would say um, there's just broader questions around, again, right of way allocation and um, being kind of mindful of like, <laughs> uh, if you're only relegating, uh, if you're trying to get the sidewalk, the mighty sidewalk that's only got six feet to do everything, and you're still looking at, you know, 80% of the right of way being dedicated to moving vehicles, then you, you had a bigger question there. And I think sometimes we often try to make impossible tasks stretch out of that uh, humble six foot sidewalk space, if, it, if that, and uh, really need to be asking ourselves broader questions around how we're allocating space in the broader right of way. Yeah, that's a great point, Pierce. Um, and I know that uh, micromobility, shared micromobility devices such as e-scooters um, are, are more prevalent in some areas of the country and in some cities than others. Um, in Chicago, we're seeing those scooters come back um, with, you know, more restrictions. Um, and uh, so I think it's an ever evolving field. Um, if anyone, if any of our panelists uh, have an opinion about how we see the future of those micromobility devices, uh, go ahead and, and let us know if you can look into your crystal ball well, I don't know if I have a crystal ball, but there's clearly people want to ride scooters. I mean, so you know, I think about when I lived in Chicago, I never rode my bike to work until I had a protected bike lane to ride the whole way. And then once the protected bike lane went in, I rode my bike to work and home almost every day. Um, when you give people the space and you, you're trying to think about your um, citywide goals for mobility and climate and you know, all these things, you need to allocate the right of way, the whole entire right of way for how you want to achieve those goals. And it, it, I mean, people on scooters or even bikes are going to ride on the sidewalk if the street is unsafe. So providing it's, it, it's a simple, it's a very complicated answer. It sounds simple, but it's, it's still very complicated. All right, thank you. Can, um, this is a, a question more for, um, Chrissy and Pierce and Mary Catherine, as you probably have more experience implementing some of these curb management strategies, um, could you provide an example of an innovative curb management uh, strategy that you have implemented and uh, what the um, reaction to that has been? I think you're muted, Mary Catherine. Oh, okay. Um, well, I mean, I think, you know, over the years, um, it's been exciting to work on curb management. I mean, I think there's actually in the chat, um, a kind of good conversation about alleys and um, loading activity. Um, I think, you know, um, one of the things I'm really excited about um, with respect to loading is um, some data efforts that are underway amongst a lot of cities to, um, kind of coordinate and come up with a uh, kind of a standardization for how we document and track uh, curb uh, assets, really like curb signs for loading um, across cities so that we all use the same kind of metric or same data specification to track our load zone signs and potentially other signs as well. And so that that really um, has one set of rules or one set of uh, you know data that can be used by maybe companies want to access that data and know where curb zones are for loading, or you know, there's just other ways. Once you know kind of the locations um, and time and date and all that of of signs, how do you improve efficiency with deliveries and dispatch and pricing? So I, I'm just really excited about that. I think in the last year, um, 
Um, the, it's the Open Mobility Foundation and a bunch of different cities around the country have been working on that. And so I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that and for the future of really showing the importance of tracking signed assets, um, signed locations and data management. And I couldn't agree more with Mary and Catherine. Um, the commercial, the growth in commercial delivery, it is putting so much pressure on the curb. And we can talk about having um, bus lanes and bike lanes, but delivery is going, drivers are going to pull into those lanes if they don't have space. So if you have assets in the alleys, you know, in, in um, Sarasota, we were measuring their alley use and we found that the city thought the alleys were like 80% occupied at some times, but they were actually across the day only about 40 to 60% occupied because, because we had that data across the entire um, hour and day to show the real, the real occupancy, not just like at 2 or 3 or 4 p.m. Um, so then we talked about, well, how much length do we need? Um, on any in any given alley, how do you charge a semi versus you know an e cargo bike or you know do you incentivize do you work in, within your pricing system that you we eventually want to have for commercial delivery to incentivize delivery at certain times a day or incentivize certain um, behaviors for delivery drivers? Um, so that's where you know I think it, again it's um, it's exciting because if you can organize delivery, you can do more with the rest of your curb space for these other uses that we we want to prioritize because every new building like every new residential building is going to need some kind of loading space and and where does that loading space go is there an alley is there a, or do we prioritize more loading docks because um, drivers want to get in and out and they're not going to look at apps or any you know they just need something automatic Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about um, challenges and we can uh, customize this a little bit. Um, Pierce talked a little bit about um, some of the overhead wires for the trolley buses and um, in Seattle. Do you guys have any other um, particular uh, challenges uh, that are unique to Seattle when it comes to curb management? I don't know that we have other unique issues. Um, you know, it, it rains a lot here. Um, so that affects um, a lot of what we can do actually um, in terms of, you know, while, you know, Pierce mentioned the painting of uh, bus, bus zones and we paint some other load zones, but we actually don't do a lot of painting because it just, there's not a lot of months of the year that we can do that. Um, I, I think, you know, um, We've been fortunate over the years to have um, some uh, politicians, uh, city council people in Seattle are set up that have um, really emphasized um, data driven decision making and have led that that's led to a really strong um, kind of set of principles in our curb management program. So that's been exciting um, that we can we have a, a political support for making kind of technical decisions for curb management and not having them be so political all the time. So that's great, actually. That's huge. And we've seen throughout this conversation and throughout the presentations, how important having as much data um, mm -hmm. and all those data points that contribute to better policy and implementation of better strategies. Um, Carmen, are there any other, um, as far as Chicago goes, some unique challenges. I know I've seen a little bit in the chat mentions of our parking constraints. Um, and then on top of that, we can just follow and open back up to the rest of the panel. Um, if you guys have, uh, could provide some uh, creative ways that you've addressed parking concerns. Um, I think for, for us in particular, the challenge is, you know, trying to do everything on some of these corridors. You know, we definitely are, are trying to find ways that there can be multimodal experience, access points, um, safety for sure, um, and making sure that we provide enough space. And some of these existing sidewalks are really limited to just the, the bare code allowed <laughs> not minimum for these for these uh, sidewalks. So I think it's a little challenging, especially with 
you know, all the options that people have for delivery drops off, you know, and it's not just that we have Uber, we have Lyft, we have taxi, we have people doing pick up and drop off for children. Um, and some of these streets also may be designated as you know, pedestrian streets. Um, talking about some of these streets that are TOD corridors where we have you know, bus routes, transit options. Um, so I think it's really challenging on the planning side of how do we accommodate all of that? Um, how do we accommodate um, all of this and, and make sure that we do it safely? Um, and some of these quarters, is, is, it's challenging because we think we can't do everything, um, especially with some of these existing conditions. When it's new developments, I definitely think there's much more of a planning effort to discuss with the developers, discuss with the designers and making sure they're providing open space, providing providing larger plaza access. So you, you'll see that in a lot of our new developments, there's a big push open space integration. Um, also making sure that there's integrated landscape, you know, not just pedestrian access, but making sure that we have you know, bike safety access, making sure that there's scooters. <laughs> we have scooters now, we have bikes, we have you know, all these other modes of transportation that are included in the development, but it's challenging when it comes to existing locations. Um, so you'll see in a, a lot of our new developments, uh, definitely there has been a real big increase in making sure that these open spaces are provided. But for now, we're also you know, trying to make sure that we're staying in coordination with other agencies like CDOT that have you know, a, a lot of, lot of great infrastructure plans themselves and trying to make sure that we're not you know, overlooking something that maybe we should make sure that we're integrating with long-term plans. And you brought up a great point, um, Carmen, that we ha that hasn't really come up yet when you mentioned pick up and drop off for um, school children and um, students, and whether they're taking transit or, you know, being dropped off by um, a parent to, uh, to school. Uh, we do actually have, uh, there is a school within our planning area for the Kimball Station um, curb management plan. And so, uh, you know, a safe routes to school element is, is definitely something that we are, you know, going to be considering when we're looking at that planning area. As far as parking concerns, I know this is, uh, parking concerns are always going to be a challenge when it comes to curb space and curb management. Um, have you guys dealt with um, or seen a creative way to address parking concerns um, in, in some of the projects that you guys have participated in? Toward toward the city for this is open to all the all the panels oh, okay <laughs> yeah um well i can only speak to these our, our projects um definitely parking is always uh it's always a concern um you can either never provide enough or you know there may be locations that are being over parked and I, I think there's been discussions back and forth on you know what's the right solution should should you know minimum parking just go away should it be case by case, you know, especially when it comes to a TOD, which allows for parking reductions because you are closer to transit. It, it opens up for development to be able to reduce those parking minimums. And it also gives them an incentive. You know, if we can increase density, they could get some of those parking reductions um, as well as trying to just minimize um, our, our footprint, trying to make sure that we're also um, taking into consideration that these places are being overparked. We're also minimizing the amount of um, hardscape, which you know we're also trying to make sure that we're being sustainable and also being sustainable, is taking into consideration of you know our heat island effect and how much that we're putting into some of these developments. Like they don't need that much parking, and some of these developments can show you know, through traffic studies or through um, actual use. We may be able to take a look at you know maybe they don't need as many maybe they're able to do something that is a shared parking with another development so that's definitely something that we're, we're always taking consideration but specifically for sustainability as well um, taking into consideration most of these developments do need to provide landscape and landscape and making sure we have enough room for that as well and setbacks uh, can be challenging for some of um, some of our projects I think that's a great point in terms of um, working on TOD projects and whether, um, and just the whole conversation around, do we eliminate parking minimums? Um, you know, I we certainly work on with a lot of cities on their parking code. 
And most parking cones were written decades ago. You know, they haven't been updated in very long times. But I think one thing that you have to make sure happens when you eliminate parking minimums is you regulate your and manage and enforce your curb <laughs> regulations. Um, because, you know, back, I don't even know, over a decade ago, um, when we first worked on Chicago's TOD ordinance, that was the one thing we heard from um, the community was, well, everyone's going to park on the street and we're not going to have any parking for our visitors. And, you know, you, so you have to provide the community with those reassurances that any change in parking policy, which, you know, we want to have more sustainable parking policies comes with that curb policy too. And, um, and, and Carmen brought up a, an interesting point about this, the city of Chicago, going back to lessons, for, lessons that we can all learn from Chicago on regulating the curb and, and just like, you know, having the concession agreement, you know, the meter agreement, you could, people didn't know the future. And we're all talking about all these different changes. It's a good lesson for how to, how to read agreement, agreements with vendors today. There, I know cities, there are so many new technology companies and vendors, and they all want to have revenue shares and prioritize, you know, figure out how to prioritize your curb space with you. And, you know, reading those agreements and comparing them to the Chicago parking meter concession agreement is a, Having read that agreement, I um, know it well, but you know it is a good practice to to make sure that um, you have the flexibility and the ownership of the curbs going forward, and you're not you know taking away any of the public's interest or the public rights there. Yeah, I mean, one thing I think we've seen from some of our newer developments, especially down near the downtown area or the, in the West Loop area, is you know these developments that you know trying to enforce okay taking consideration all these residents, all these new, you know, condos or apartments, is the amount of people trying to share the same curb, the same entryways, you know, um, deliveries, drop-offs from all these different vendors, not including ride shares. Um, a lot of these developments are trying to access maybe the alleys, and that's how they're using their delivery drop-off, but it's at the same time, who's there on the curb in the street to actually enforce that they're not supposed to be picking up and dropping off from, from the streets. Um, well, some, some of the things that we've heard from adjacent um, it's companies that have to use these shared dri driveways and alleys is, you know, those, those alleys may not be sustained, like they may not be like infrastructurally sound to provide all of this you know, loading and loading uh, traffic that they have now. Having to make sure that they're not affecting the adjacent building, especially with some of these you know, older older developments, is the amount of weight that some of these trucks are bringing every day. Now you're having multiple trucks coming in and out, uh, making sure that they're doing existing conditions analysis that some of some of those alleys can even support. Uh, so there's always, uh, I guess, challenges with that. So keep in mind that that's part of, or should be at least part of some of these analysis that we're doing. Because if we are providing recommendations on access, making sure that they're actually able to sustain the, the weight that we're requesting. Thank you so much, guys. Um, all of those um, questions and answers have provided a ton of value to this conversation. Uh, I want to open it up now. Um, we've got about like 17 minutes or so left on the call. So I want to open it up now to um, questions from the chat and from our attendees. And if you haven't asked a question that you've thought of yet, now is the time to do so. Um, I'll pass it over to Michael. Um, if you could go ahead and pose some of those questions to our panelists. Sounds good. <clears throat> Thanks, Robert. Uh, lots of chatting and discussion, especially about how alleyways uh, and our extensive network of alleys in the city here at Chicago can um, complement curve space, but I'll, I'll um, and maybe we get to that in a moment, but I'll get to one of the first questions that was really about um, bike lanes at curb spaces and, and um, uh, bike lanes are frequently blocked regarding, regardless of what is happening, uh, whether it's a, at a bus stop or a delivery zone. And so are there, are there any other additional ways to think about um, how bike lanes can function uh, Pierce, you had a really great example in your presentation. Um, you know, we frequently see uh, 
at bus stop locations, those bike lanes being uh, blocked. And so you have that great example of a bus stop that's away from the curb. Um, so um, could you speak a little bit to any, maybe any learning lessons about that, pros and cons about this strategy? Yeah, so um, it's like a shared cycle track bus stop. Um, we are starting to use it a lot more in the city of Seattle. Um, it's a really effective and compared to other options like a full on transit island, uh, much more cost uh, friendly <laughs> option uh, uh, and uh, does a better job of fitting in certain spaces within the right of way. We just honestly didn't want to give up for um, folks. If you think about the potential conflict areas between cyclists and buses, like that's the last spot you want to give up uh, on, on your bike facility, bike, faci uh, bike facility treatment. And so we, um, we've seen really good success with it, honestly, and we'll continue using it um, uh, where it makes sense. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's another one of many sort of calculations that you have to make in these complicated uh, projects where you're trying to figure out how to allocate space in the right of way. And one other thing that we've looked at is where are, um, are there, al alternatives isn't the right word, but are there more pedestrian or, or um, focused streets where you could um, build bike lanes? So, you know, if you have a commercial street that you know there's just going to be a lot of different activity, um, are, are there better paths to build the bike lane so that it's not all on just one street, you know, within one right of way? So, you know, we're looking at just an overall neighborhood area or different corridors to say, well, which is the right corridor for a bike lane or which is the right corridor for a pedestrian or for a um, commercial delivery lane or passenger pickup and drop off lane? Um, this is very Catherine. I just add that um, you know one project we have in design um, now is we have a um, kind of major transit corridor that goes north south um, north of downtown um, and you know with water in Seattle you know we often in the hills we have limited areas for you know kind of transit pathways and bike pathways and so we're combining it's a transit route uh, plus a, bike, a bicycle protected bicycle lane. So um, most of the curb along the main street is getting um, removed, but we're moving almost all of the load zones to the right around the corner on the side streets. Um, we'll see how this goes. I mean, you know, cause I think, you know, um, but I think we're, um, we are trying to actively acknowledge that loading is a still priority, but it can't necessarily happen on the main street. Um, although we might have some curb access on the main street, but we're also adding load zones on the side streets around the corner. So I think there's just ways um, acknowledging that it all has to kind of fit in somewhere and just try and um, really sit down with people and kind of work out the puzzle pieces. And I think communication overall is really what's helpful is to be able to talk through it all and not just have to like, oh, hey, we forgot. Um, so, cause that's, you know, those that doesn't often turn out well, so. I'll jump in real quickly. Want to make sure that we get to Jordan. Looks like we have a hand raised. Do you have a question? If you do, you could go ahead and unmute. That was an accident. Thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. No worries. <laughs> Back to you, Michael. <laughs> uh, thanks. Yeah, just another question, um, maybe around education of curb space. Um, I don't think, um, you know, in in a social setting, curb space isn't really talked about too much or, or really understood necessarily. So um, anything you could say about education um, surrounding all the things that we're talking about? And then maybe twofold um, would also be specifically towards um, drivers, deliverers, commercial vehicle operators. Um, there's a comment about um, not only education, but also how many of them will budget fines and tickets right into their budget. So um, maybe it's, you know, getting a fine or a ticket isn't really a blow, so to speak, when it's received because, well, it's budgeted. So um, Mary Catherine, you did a great job of, you know, trying to address some of that already in the chat, but um, anything that anyone else could speak to regarding education, but also 
how those fines and tickets are working. Um, well, if I could just add, because this is actually one of my favorite topics, um, and I actually talk about curbside management when I'm out and about, and I would obviously encourage everybody to do that. Um, but uh, I put in the chat, we have a brochure, um, can I park here just for general awareness for people. Um, there are a lot of cities that do this, um, and we translate this into, I think, about a dozen languages. Our main um, focus that people that distribute it is at our municipal court. So if somebody gets a ticket, you know, our judges hand them a brochure, say, hey, try not to come by next time. Um, so I think that's helpful. Um, I mean, I think it comes down to like what's with respect to commercial vehicles really comes down to design because you know they're gonna do the trips they have to make because that's their business. And I don't I don't know what's so much as saying, well, they get fees and that's just part of their budget. I mean, no one wants to spend money they don't have to. Um, and a good number of the deliveries are made by one person shops or a small business. And so we wanna make sure we're providing kind of legitimate access for people um, and help people not get tickets. Um, and so I think that's why, you know, conversations and communication about the loading needs are really helpful as we build out our transportation system so that we're, you know, we're addressing the needs instead of just saying, you know, oh, they're just gonna park in the illegally anyway, so. Because I think what they want is, you know, people want reliability, you know, it's, you don't wanna penalize the delivery drivers. They're out delivering kegs and, massive boxes and someone brought up gigantic TVs I and mean, they're doing their job. Uh, we want to make it easier for them and we want to provide them with a reliable space. So, you know, and that really takes thinking about what is the area you're trying to manage and talking to every business in that area to say, what kind of trucks deliver? Um, are you, is it coming from a local um, shop or is it a national planned um, truck route? I mean, what can you really influence? And then how do you work with the drivers? I mean, like I said, a lot of times I think drivers, it's just the way they've always done it. So they, you know, they're just used to parking in the bike lane, you know, that's where they park or, or parking in a turn lane. So I, you know, if it comes down to really talking to the drivers and the um, commercial delivery drivers, and then talking with the businesses um, to just learn about what they need and then think through how you can make these changes. Uh, one thing to add, I'm not sure if all you know, cities do this, but um, also discussing with the transportation departments on what are the approved truck routes, because if that's something that, you know, thinking long term, I mean, those are things that are published. Um, those routes are, are accessible to everyone. You know, I know Chicago has uh, the truck routes published, and I know there's within this last year definitely discussions on taking a look at those and um, making sure that we're discussing with you know the aldermen to you know to make sure that we're hearing what this community is hearing. Because sometimes we hear like the pain points of there's so much traffic, there's so much congestion, um, and one of one of the factors may be what are the approved truck routes, and that could be a start to how can we take those and try to do micro routes that make sense. Um, again, those efforts take you know, quite a long time planning, but I think that's an important place to, to start is you know, what are the approved routes that we already have in place that we can work with? This is great, thank you so much for that. Um, just some comments and questions in the chat also regarding uh, transportation justice and equity. I know we kind of, as you as panelists, covered that a little bit earlier on. But anything more that you can say about that, perhaps how um, transportation justice and equity is framed in the planning process, maybe with a focus on uh, small business owners, uh, minority business owners, uh, or uh, um, delivery operators for that matter. Um, anything else that anyone cares to share on that one? I guess I would have, offer a slightly different take and think about it through person throughput and mode share. Who's using it? What services? So how are you prioritizing that curb space for whom? 
and uh, who, who uses it in that sense. Um, in particular, we are really serious about addressing like urban heat island uh, impacts and other climate justice related issues. Uh, oftentimes transit and we're rapidly working to electrify all of our services. We don't have any, all of our buses are either powered by trolley electric buses um, or hybrid diesels. And we're phasing out all of our hybrid diesels to battery electric buses in the next 15 years. Um, actually less than that now. Um, and like that's, th this is a pressing issue. And um, if we continue to like really wrangle our heads over trying to preserve like one parking space um, when we could be moving like dozens of people uh, and that, that that's the trade-off, like, and you think about the sort of carbon emissions associated with that and sort of uh, climate being seen as a threat multiplier for disadvantaged communities, we should really start, there's an intersect, there are intersections of all these things that interact with one another. And we don't often do the best job, like really articulating how these issues are compounded. And it, of course, like when you're talking to, uh, you know, a landowner or someone like about like why you're displacing them and like, they don't want to hear about how this one parking space like is going to be make or break for our climate crisis but it when you start chipping at away at it like one after one like then you start to create a bigger issue and so it's um it's complicated i think it's a both and i think we need to get a bit more creative and be intentional about how we reserve these dedicated pick up and drop off spaces for folks um maybe like getting creative with alleyways or side streets as Mayor Catherine alluded to, but we also can't lose sight of the fact that um, by continuing to prioritize like uh, these really carbon emission heavy uh, modes, uh, we, we really uh, imperil everyone and particularly those who are most disadvantaged. Thanks, Pierce. Appreciate that. Um, you know, there's been, the you know, we've had a focus on the discussion today being in larger cities, um, Seattle, Chicago, uh, but, um, you know, there's definitely a, a benefit to thinking about this in smaller, medium-sized cities, um, suburban locations, and um, is there any experience any of the panelists have with uh, working in some of these smaller communities. I know, Chrissy, you mentioned a few in your in your presentation, of course, but um, maybe if you could speak to that or or what some of the differences might be that you are hearing through public engagement in the smaller communities related to that or, or uh, what the differences might be. Yeah, so um, we work with a lot of even small cities of 10,000 people that might have a, a busy commercial area or, or you know, Main Street area um, and in lots of just mid sized cities, they all have challenges <laughs> with curb management. Um, I think one of the bigger challenges, I mean, this face is, Pierce brought this up earlier, was resources. You know, there just aren't enough staff resources um, or investment available in general to really plan and allocate and, and think about like we want these geofenced congestion price curbs that you know prioritize all the modes we want um, i think that's a challenge everywhere but especially in small cities where they might not even have curbs um, you know there are many are figuring figuring out like regulating parking as a first step let alone paid parking that's enforced and enforced and you have um you know enough officers out enforcing your different regulations. So there's different challenges, but it all comes back to the same thing. Um, clear processes, processes and data um, can figure out those issues, um, you know, and figure out why you wouldn't prioritize parking over some other things. Like in Noblesville, we saw the city just allocated 10 spaces for short-term parking and those spaces were turning over constantly. People really paid attention to the regulation. And we see that in cities, large and small, when you have those temporary spaces, people use them um, according to the regulation. When you start to have the longer term spaces, that's where they get abused if they're not enforced.
think we're uh, about at time, Robert. Um, I want to hand it back to you. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Thank you for monitoring the chat. We really appreciate it. Um, I want to give another thank you to our panelists. Um, you guys have been great. Thanks so much for your time um, and effort today and also leading up to today. Um, so Chrissy, Carmen, Pierce, and uh, Mary Catherine had to go, but you guys have been great. Thank you so much. I also want to give a shout out to our team at the RTA um, for helping put this on. Our communications team has been awesome, and uh, we wouldn't be able to put these on without you guys. So thank you so much. Um, and Jessica reminded folks as well that we do have our fourth rendition um, next week uh, that we put the link to register in the chat. And that is about accessing transportation data throughout the Chicagoland region. Um, so we're excited to host our fourth and final Transportation Tuesday next week. Thank you for everyone who's joined um, and for those who had to go early. Um, this is recorded, so this will be available on YouTube um, after the fact. If you want to go back and look at something um, or if you want to reach out to myself or any of our panelists, please do so. Um, thanks again, everyone, and have an awesome afternoon.